So what we have here in the pink, in these two little sections, is a very classic uh, rug making technique, I suppose, called the Geordie's Knot. And I've got two sections of it here, and if you look very closely over here, you can see that my first little bit I did over groups of four threads each. So each little knot is over four threads. And I was a little bit disappointed in the result because I felt that it was lacking in stability. And the Geordie's knot, if you've read the little bit that I wrote about Geordie's knots um, to go with this video, the Geordie's knot is, is supposed to be incredibly stable and incredibly strong and I felt that these actually weren't. I also, if you look on the side, got considerable draw in. Can you see the difference between the edges of my sumac and the section of the Geordie's knots over four uh, um, groups of warp ends? And that also wasn't good and that's one of the reasons why this is riding up so badly on the selvage. But I'm not going to worry about that because in actual fact it's just a sample and an experiment. And it's actually good that you can see what the implications are of um, using a very closely set technique like this after a technique that has been more widely spaced and how it affects our tension. So just sort of take that on board as, as a lesson, really. Now, the formation of the Geordie's knot, there are several ways of doing it. And the simplest one seems to be uh, what I will be demonstrating here, which is to leave my yarn is actually on the floor um, and I'm running on a continuous uh, length of yarn. You could, uh, you know, go to the trouble of cutting like about a, a gazillion sh little short pieces of yarn and then you would just tie them in. But that's just an awful lot of PT and as you know, I'm not a great fan of PT that wastes my time. So I'm just going to use the continuous length and um, show you how it works. And astonishingly, this is something that I found really, really difficult to write down, this instruction. I found it very, very difficult to explain verbally. So hopefully the video will just give you a little bit more information. So in this little section here, I, I am, you can see very clearly, working in groups of two warp threads each. So I'm going to pick up my two warp threads. This is a finger manipulated technique. And if um, when we come to actually looking at how to do the loops on the rear, uh, you will see that I'm going to use a butterfly for that. But for now, it's just easy to have the ball of yarn um, on the floor. And I'm just running it off as I need it. So I take my two threads. I put the tail through the center of the two threads. Take it around the top like that and bring the tail out underneath the loop. Sorry for all the extraneous noise. I don't know why there seems to be so much noise around today. That was a very loud airplane flying over and there's a door banging somewhere and it's not mine. So I can't really do terribly much about it. And you just pull it down nice and firm and snip it off. Take your next group of two, put your tail through the two warp threads. Your tail is actually your working end here. It goes around the top of those two warp threads and you bring it out through the center. So in actual fact, it looks exactly like that. And you just pull it together and pull it down and snip it off. And you can be really, really very firm um, about doing this. Uh, for anybody that's watching this video that's kind of au fait with um, Persian carpets and that sort of thing. You might know that one of the uh, um, indications of quality in a Persian rug, especially an antique rug or a silk rug or something like that, is the number of knots that there are per square inch. And it's this type of knot that they're talking about. So I think just by seeing how this actually works just gives us an idea of how much intense labor goes into the making of one of those truly magnificent and very valuable handmade rugs. This, when I started off doing this, I have to say that it felt like it was very 
slow and painstaking, but as I've kind of gone on with it and I'm developing a bit of a rhythm, I'm finding it quite mesmerizing and very pleasant to do. So I'm going to carry on doing that and until I get to the end of the row and then I'm going to show you how um, we're going to put in a couple of rows to separate it before I do the next row of the knot. And I'm so much happier with doing it just on two pairs of warp threads as opposed to four groups, uh, a group of four warp threads. I'm just finding that this is just so much more firm, it's, it's much more solid, it's just much, much, much better. So that's a very good uh, lesson that I learned there and I'm passing it on to you and I hope you take it on board and that is that when you're doing a Geordie's knot work with gr smaller groups of warp threads rather than larger groups of warp threads. So I'm going to carry on and then we're going to put in our separators and we're going to start another row of the knots. So there we are at the end of my row and the fact that my left hand salvage has not ridden up nearly as much as my right hand one suggests to me that I have a tension issue possibly on the side of the loom. So <clears throat> I'm just going to press on with it for the moment. Um, and I think once I've done this little section, I shall probably cut it off and just retie and just fix up my tension because that's uh, really not comfortable at all. So for my weft thread that comes in between my rows of knots, you can see I'm using a very fine cotton. Um, this is a 10 by 2 cotton. You could use um, a, a fine ashford cotton, so a lace weight cotton or something like that would do the same thing. You need to have rows of plain weave in between your rows of knots to stabilize everything. And the number of picks of plain weave that you put in between your rows of knots really depends on a number of things. Um, most importantly is the length of, of the pile that you're leaving. So, <coughs> excuse me, the longer the pile that you're leaving, the more rows of plain weave you can have uh, between your rows of knots. Now, the number of picks of plain weave that you have between your rows of knots also uh, will determine obviously the density of your weave. And you can see as I tap that down there, it's quite um, resistant for the first pick. So if you find that you're having a problem um, beating it down with your reed, then just use your shuttle to really push it down into place. If you have a tapestry beater or something like that, that's probably also a good thing to use. So I'm just putting in four picks of plain weave here. And you can see as I lean down on my shuttle, you can see how that compacts. Bearing in mind that this is essentially uh, related to a weft dominant techniques. So you kind of want your weft to pack down into your warp, which is why I'm using such a fine thread. And there's my fourth one. And now I'm ready to do another row of knots. And the process for doing the second row of knots remains exactly the same as the process for doing the first one. So I'm going to just tuck my shuttle behind the reed working on a closed shed and I'm going to start the whole process again right from the right hand salvage so my yarn goes in over the top of those two and pull it down and snip it off as you can find your snips and just by the way these little snips are worth their weight absolutely in gold when you're doing something like this especially if your fingers are starting to get a little bit knobbly like mine are and getting them in and out of the loop of a pair of scissors is actually a bit of a fussy thing to do so just being able to pick your snips up and put them down without any fuss is worth so much and I've suddenly developed 10 thumbs instead of nice working fingers Now, there is a discrepancy in the length of the pile. Obviously, that will all be brushed up and trimmed off at a later stage. So I'm going to build this up to about that much, and then we're going to see what it looks like after that. <laughs> 